Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Wes Moore is the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, one of the largest anti-poverty organizations in the country. He is the author of the bestsellers, The Other Wes Moore and The Work. His latest book, Five Days, is an illuminating portrait of Baltimore in the aftermath of the death of Freddie Gray. His account of five days in the life of a city on the edge is told through eight characters on the front lines of the uprising that overtook Baltimore and riveted the world. Now let's join Chris Jackson, the publisher and editor-in-chief of One World, in conversation with author Wes Moore. Hey Wes, how you doing? I'm good, Chris. How you doing, man? Really good, really good. I'm so glad that we're able to sit and talk about your book uh, again. It's a book that's been really important to me um, in uh, in these moments of of tumults right now that are going on in the in the world around us. Um, and before we get started talking about the book, I just want to, where where are you now? You are you are the CEO of Robin Hood Foundation, which is yeah. New York. But you're still living in in Baltimore. But I'm still living in Baltimore, and it, it was it was that actually came up when Robin Hood first approached me, even about uh, about the job at Robin Hood. Where my first initial reaction to them was, I don't think this is a good idea. And one of the big reasons why I told him that was, I said, you know, I'm a I'm a Baltimorean, and I and I live down here in Baltimore, and and I wasn't planning on moving my family up, and and eventually after conversations, we decided that you don't have to be up there, uh, and so literally for the past three and a half years, I've been commuting, back and forth, and so uh, and so this is where I, so I when everything happened and we ended up closing the office due to COVID nineteen, uh, obviously just ended up staying down here. Right, but the work I'm sure has been really busy. It's been, this has been the most chaotic work schedule um, that I know that maybe I've ever experienced. And and that actually, ironically, that actually even includes deployment um, where, and I thought that was a crazy and chaotic and completely unpredictable work schedule. But I think the, and part of the reason is because the the whole world is, is shifting and changing under our feet. And, you know, there is no, there really is not this sense of, of, of certainty that people are living with. And so I think for all of us and for all of our industries, for all of our areas, um, we're all being asked to just reevaluate everything. The way we re- reevaluate our own work, reevaluate our own complicity and the need for it, um, reevaluate, you know, how we're going to measure success and who we're going to work with to be able to get it done. And so this has been this has been an absolutely chaotic, um, you know, time time and experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I've loved about working with you, and this is our third book together, yes, is that your books are always about um, kind of about that very thing, like trying to figure out answers to these kind of fundamental first principle big questions. Um, your first book, The Other West Moore, I think at its heart had a question. Um, in fact, was driven by this question of why does one life go one way, another life goes another. Mm-hmm. Um, that was what made the book, I think, so exciting for readers is because as readers, you were you brought us right into that question and that sense of curiosity. We understood what was at stake in these two lives that you were laying out—the life of you know your own life and the life of the other young man named Westmore. Um, and that one course became kind of a classic book sold over a million copies still selling lots of copies finding new readers all the time so i think it comes to something gets something really fundamental to the question um and then of course your second book the work also goes to i think a really deep fundamental question about how it is that we find meaning um in our lives and uh again by using elements of your story but also bringing in stories of other people as you did in the other one more um, to try to answer this kind of really basic question in your own life, going from Oxford to Afghanistan, where you were a combat officer, to the White House, where you were a fellow, to Wall Street, and then back home to Baltimore. Um, and in this book, we pick up in Baltimore again, and there's another deep fundamental question at stake, um, and one that I think really resonates with this moment that we're in right now. And so what, what was for you in this new book? five days, what was the question at the heart of it? 
that you needed to answer as you did in the previous books? You know, I, I, I think the, the question actually really started uh, when was actually sitting in Freddie Gray's funeral. And it was one of these things where it was, it was the first funeral I had ever attended where I didn't know the person while they were living. Um, I had learned about, the first time I learned about Freddie Gray, he was in a coma. And, and I went to his funeral because thousands of people went to Freddie Gray's funeral. And, and the truth is, is that, and the, the irony and the heartbreak is that more people went to his funeral than actually knew nor cared about him in his life. And so I'm sitting there inside this church and I'm looking around these people. And, and when I was there early, I was there when there were only hundreds of people there. Eventually there were thousands that, you know, filled every single space inside, inside the church. Um, but you find yourself kind of looking around saying, are, is anyone here really prepared to do what it takes to make his life actually matter in this moment? And what was seen and what was not seen with him um, because we knew of this history of just this, this chronic uh, and the, 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 the chronic nature of systemic racism that played itself out in Baltimore City and beyond, but you know, specifically in this case of Freddie Gray. We knew of the reality of the fact that if you were born and raised in Harlem Park, you know, your life expectancy was about 20 years shorter than people who were raised in Roland Park, which was two and a half miles away. Wow. You know, 20 year life expectancy difference. And so it goes back to this thing where, where I'm sitting there looking at Freddie's casket and I didn't even take the walk up to the casket, but I'm sitting there looking at his casket from afar and thinking to myself, uh, how incredibly unfair it is and was that when you look at this young man that maybe the most peaceful week of his life was the week that he was in a coma. Huh. Because that was a week, it was during that week that everybody, that he was surrounded by doctors and nurses and, and, and everyone in the city knew his name and, and everyone in the city cared whether he lived or died. Right. And then one week before that, in his 25 years, that you could have made that same argument. And so the thing that I really wanted to explore with, with, with five days was being able to walk through that time period through these different sets of eyes, through these eight other people, and, and be able to really dissect and understand this issue of how insidious racism has been and how it has touched every single frame and mechanism within our society. So when you watch this life of Freddie Gray, who was born into a deep poverty, whose mother lived and existed in a deep poverty, how this idea and this myth of hard work, this idea and this myth of everyone has a shot, this idea and this myth of, of what the American dream encapsulates, that, that it is, it's actually exactly that, right? It's this, it's this temporary state of consciousness that isn't real. Maybe you just tell us a little bit, first of all, just about what happened to Freddie Gray and when it happened. Yeah, so Freddie Gray uh, had, did, committed the crime of making eye contact with police. Right. And I, and, I, and I say that because I think it's really important for the listeners to understand what I just said the crime of making eye contact with police and running. Because in certain neighborhoods that are deemed high crime neighborhoods, that is enough to trigger probable cause, which is enough to trigger an arrest, eye contact. So if he does that in Harlem Park, it's probable cause. If he does that in Roland Park, he's going for a jog. So already from the initial contact that he had with police, you see how this disparity exists. Then what ended up happening was he, you know, he makes eye contact with police, he runs. Uh, eventually he's, he's, he's arrested uh, and they find what they deem to be an illegal pocket knife on him and he's, he's put in handcuffs and he's put inside the back of a police van. An hour after he was arrested, he was in a coma. And when he finally made it to the medical, to the University of Maryland Medical Center, it's deemed that he had three broken vertebrae and also a crushed larynx, a crushed voice box. Right. And so the thing that led to the protests that took place around Freddie Gray was about the fact that, you know, that once again, we now had, a, you know, a situation where you had no accountability for this life 
for this young man who makes eye contact with police and an hour later he's in a coma and people have no explanation as to what happened. But it also is falling on the heels of something much bigger and not just something much bigger in Baltimore. When you look at the case of Baltimore, the reality is in Baltimore alone, just in the two years before Freddie Gray, you had Anthony Anderson and Chris Brown and Tyrone West, people who had similar situations that ended up following the same fate. But even before then, you also heard the names Michael Brown and Van Lano Castile and Laquan McDonald and, and Sandra Bland and, and Tamir Rice and Eric Gardner and Sean Bell and, and, and. And so you had this thing and, uh, and, and I, it was, it's interesting, Chris, because it's one of the things I actually wanted to explore was this idea of what made Freddie different? What made Freddie different than Tyrone West? What made Freddie different than Laquan, than, uh, than, um, than uh, uh, Chris Brown or Anthony Anderson? People in Baltimore right. where this happened. Just a little while before. Just a little while before, right? Similar situations, but those cases just went away without the protest, without that type of thing, without the sustained protest. Um, and, and I think there was kind of two big things that made this, this situation different. One was the fact that it was caught on camera. Uh, and, and, you know, we now have a situation where we are watching these incidences. We are watching homicide on camera and at the hands of people who are sworn to protect and serve communities. And so there was a one piece where, unlike the other ones, Freddie Gray and watching what happened to Freddie Gray was actually something that was then went viral. Right. The second piece, though, um, was I think it, it, it was the creation and the birth and the growth of this organization called Black Lives Matter. Right. Where without Black Lives Matter and having Black Lives Matter going from essentially a, a, a hashtag to then becoming this global movement that could actually move and mobilize quickly in different areas, you potentially have a very different result for Freddie Gray. Had that not been on camera and had Black Lives Matter not been in place, I don't know if any of us, any of us know the name Freddie Gray. You know, I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, I think one of the, the things that's really interesting about the way you kind of pursue this question, though, is there's the Freddie Gray story, but basically we don't really see Freddie Gray in the book. I mean, we see him in the very beginning because obviously this initiates both your, your curiosity, but, but also the uprising that, that took place in Baltimore during that time. But you don't write about Freddie Gray in the book. Um, you write about other people. Um, and why did you choose to tell that story, the story of different Baltimoreans over this five day period on Freddie Gray's story? Yeah, you know, it, and it, it's, uh... It's a really good question, Chris, because, uh, you know, and, and I remember going back and forth, you know, with, with, with you on this and, and thinking like, I don't want this to be the Freddie Gray story, right? I don't want this to be Fre a biography of Freddie Gray. I feel like there are other people who can and should tell that story. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the situation that existed that Freddie Gray then had to live in. And where Freddie Gray is a symbol of something else. Freddie Gray is a symbol of, the, of, this, of this larger pain that we are asking these children and particularly black children to exist in. Uh, this level of poverty that we are continuing to tolerate for certain people as long as it doesn't touch nor impact us. And so I, I wanted to, and so, you know, as I was, I just kept on hearing from so many people dozens of folks in Baltimore about what happened, about their opinions, about their thoughts. And, and it's very, I mean, and Baltimore is unique in that way where everyone's going to have an opinion about something. But, but what I wanted to do is really kick in and say, okay, if I'm listening to all these different conversations that we're having, uh, how can I pick a sample set of people who I think in many ways represent the complexity of the moment and the complexity of the opinions? And so that's where it was going back and saying, okay, well, uh, you know, having the perspective of someone like a Tawanda Jones, who sit, whose brother died in police custody just 18 months prior, and is, and, is, and is happy about the fact that Baltimore is rising up and standing up, but is also thinking to herself, but where was this when my brother was killed? Yeah. Or, or, or getting the perspective of, or getting the perspective of, of Mark Partee, a, a, a police major who grew up in West Baltimore, 
and who literally said to me, he's like, listen, I know for a fact that none of my colleagues woke up that morning with homicide in their mind. Hmm. But I also understand for kids in West Baltimore, why they don't believe me. Right. You know, having the perspective of, 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 a, commu- of a small, uh, of a general manager and, and, and community leader, a guy named Anthony Williams, who runs this r- roller skating ring called Shake and Bake, which is in the heart of West Baltimore. And he only employs kids. He, he only really employs kids who he knew couldn't get employed elsewhere. The right. ones who didn't have the degrees or maybe had a record or maybe had tattoos that was keeping them from moving on to the next round of interviews. And he always would let them know, but you got a job here. And he would train them up and work with them and get them job experience and get them money. And, and, and how watching it through his eyes was so different where he immediately went to not just the fact that these were the kids that helped to save his shop when, all the, when, when, the, when, the, when the looting started happening, but also immediately his mind went to, well, what do we all, what can we all do? And what's my role in helping to rebuild what is a very ruptured and broken city right now? And so just trying to understand it through all these different lenses from the, from the son of the owner of the Baltimore Orioles to a public defender, having to, to get a chance to understand how these different perspectives, I think really encapsulate the myriad of ideas and, 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 and thoughts surrounding what happened but also where they all collide on a certain singular point. And that certain singular point that all of these perspectives and, and, and ideas collide on is this frustration and with this intolerance towards deep poverty. And this intolerance towards the fact that we have cre- intentionally created systems where we are literally giving children not a chance to be able to make it through. And, and, uh, and us only, all, owning our own complicity in that as a society, but then also us coming up with some form of path became important as well. Yeah, you know, so I think one of the great things about the book to me is that it really does like, you know, you talk about BLM, Black Lives Matter being sort of uh, fundamental to like the, the elevating Freddie's story and making this protest happen. And, and you know, there's a piece in the Times the other day on the thought where it's like, it is probably the largest protest movement in history. Like it is encompassed mm-hmm people in more parts of the world in a more sustained way over a longer period of time than any movement in history, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, but at the heart of Black Lives Matter is this phrase, Black Lives Matter. And I think your book represents that so well, because you have people in the book from every strata of society, all the way from the, you know, super wealthy, you know, owners of the Baltimore Orioles, down to the kids in the street. What brought them all together was one life. Now it's a life that we think doesn't matter, a life that we overlook, you know, as much as we possibly can. You know, the kid who doesn't get a break, who led poison when he's a kid, who, you know, is harassed by the police. That life doesn't matter. It matters though. It matters to every single strata of that society had to deal with that life ultimately. And shows how and just as this whole country has been brought to a brought to a halt by the Black Lives Matter movement that's followed this last set of, of deaths. Those lives matter, not just in the moral sense, but in the sense that nothing in this country can progress unless we first reckon with this oldest problem, which is valuing with any kind of equality and in terms of equity and fairness, the lives of all of its people. That's right. Because, because if we don't do that, then everything else we are standing on is a lie. Absolutely. And that and that's and that's that's this point of that is this point of reckoning that I think this country is going through right now is 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 the the same fabrics, the same documents, the same things that everyone holds true and everyone learned about when they were school children. Right. The Constitutional Congress in 1776 and the battles between founding fathers about what words would be included and what words would not be included, despite the fact that they knew those words did not incorporate many people who they were interacting with every single day and who they saw as property. This is a fundamental reckoning for this country to ask, or were we built on aspiration or were we built on lies? And this is our chance to be able to answer that question. Because true progress cannot happen if we are not talking about true progress for all. And that is not, to your point, that's not just a lofty statement. That's our moral documents. Right. That, is, that, is, that is the inception 
of this country. That is the first thing this country agreed to. And so if we're not willing to honor that, yeah. then what does it say about everything else? One of the things that I just definitely don't want to leave this out is uh, the, the kind of technique that you and Eric agree in your co-author um, employed in writing this book, which I think is so uh, apt and appropriate for the kind of story you tell. It has the energy of an oral history in the sense that you go from one perspective to another to another. Yeah. Now that allows you to layer in the, the sort of kaleidoscopic portrait of a city going through this convulsive experience, but you see both the city going through a convulsive experience, you also see the internal convulsion in each of the characters as they have to reckon with the death of Freddie Gray. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how is it that you were able to pull together these eight characters and, and tell their stories? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, and, and I tell you, Chris, and I, and I, give, and I give you a lot of credit to this because uh, one of the books that you recommended uh, that we check out early was this book called Nine Lives. And it was about New Orleans. And it was about New Orleans over decades. Mm -hmm. um, but it was incredibly helpful and informative about how exactly can you tell these various stories and keep it moving in a sync. I mean, one of the things I think that I, I, I love about this story is it has a very tight knit bow of these five days, right? right? It was about how are we talking about the most explosive five days during this time period? And also the arc of the five days are incredibly drastic. If you talk to most people on that Saturday and said, by the way, by Wednesday, the city would have been in rioting. We would have now been in a, in a, in a, in a state of emergency that the streets would have been cleared. They'd be playing ball games with no fans. <laughs> on that Saturday, most people would have said, that's crazy. That makes no sense. I mean, I know there's protesting, but that's not where this is going. And that's exactly where it went. We're talking five days, how this thing actually imploded that quickly. And so, so the fact that you had this knot of the five days was actually really helpful because I think in, in the same way you saw kind of this character arc for each of the people, uh, where, where you saw, uh, you know, I, I think some of the most powerful scenes is when you watch, you know, Jenny, who was a, a, a white public defender, have to really confront her own, uh, you know, her own bias. When a, when a young black kid picks up her phone that she dropped and her immediate assumption was, oh, he's gonna steal it from me. And he looks at her and he says, you thought I was gonna steal your phone, didn't you? And she's like, wow, I did. And this is a person who committed her life to supporting these kids and here she is, her immediate reaction is, this kid's about to steal my phone and here I am screaming for him to give me my phone back. Um, you know, to someone like Parti, who at the beginning of that five days was a high flying police major and one of the highest ranking African-Americans on the police force, it's not, by the end of the five days, he's doing beat cop work because he basically got demoted during this time period. But you see this arc for these characters, but you also see this arc for Baltimore where over, over just a five day period, you watch this tremendous shift in a major American city. And, and so that's what I thought was one of the most powerful things that it's very, it's very fast moving. It's very action packed. It, uh, to, to go through these, lot, through these individual lives and what was happening during that period. Um, but that's exactly how those days were. You know, those days were just, were a complete flurry of emotion and activity and people basically just trying to figure it out as they were going along and trying to respond to the different things and the different conditions that were being presented on the ground. Uh, but I feel like the book really tried to capture that intensity and that tempo uh, in a way that, that, that showed people just what was at stake and also just what was lost during that time period. And this is actually maybe a way to transition to our, our next quick question about sort of books that you're, you're thinking about and reading right now. We are seeing with your book and some other books that have come out, this idea of people trying to get to a fresh understanding, you know, people who are particularly white people or people who are not black, of how to be anti-racist, how to kind of approach, uh, approach history in, in, in new ways and how to join these movements for change. Now, when, in your experience talking to people on the ground in Baltimore and thinking about like the sort of aftermath of this uprising, do you see sort of the, the role of um, the sort of white accomplice or ally um, as being something that, that was sustained beyond that first protest? Do you think of it as something that's sustainable now um, beyond, you know, people hopefully reading some books and educating themselves, but do you think it's a sustainable 
thing, uh, just based on what on your own experience. Yeah, um, I, I I think that the first step that that the the the, the allies and the uh, and the and the co-conspirators have to have to also have to first understand and have to really embrace is history. And and I think that you know that that for so many things and for there there is this idea and there is this myth about race and racism that racism is an act right that racism is this thing that people do or don't do that helps to determine whether they are racist or not um that if they if i, I don't i don't say the n word or i don't you know uh attend you know uh, you know, white supremacist rallies, or I don't paint black over Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, you know, but so, so therefore I'm not racist. Without understanding that racism isn't an act, it is a system that has been baked into every system within our society. Whether you're talking about, you know, whether you're talking about our education system, or our banking system, or our housing system, every element has been shaped with racism as, as one of the key ingredients in its shaping. And so I think one of the first things that people have to be able to do is to be able to both learn and accept and understand history, because I think that's the thing that is going to keep this from being a kind of like an emotional moment yeah. to actually being something that's bigger. When, when I'm just feeling bad, that's the difference between, you know, sympathy and empathy. Where, where if I feel bad for a person, that's sympathy. I'm sympathetic to that person, right? But empathy is when their pain is my pain too. And I have to understand my own role in causing that pain. And now it's not saying, it's not going back to this argument, people are saying, well, you know, well, why am I being punished for something that my ancestors did? Well, the response is because we're still being punished for things as your ancestors did. And so our ability to be able to own that and, and understand that and embrace that is going to be incredibly important in this. The second thing is I, I think that people have to be able to embrace the idea that that piecemeal is not going to work. Um, you know, and, and I see it right now oftentimes in these debates and these conversations about what do we need to do? You know, obviously, I understand that the idea of pacing and and what goes first and I, and I get it. But at the end of this process, um, you know, if, if the thing that you are advocating for is, is, uh, is the end to chokeholds and no-knock warrants, um, then I really do question how much your allyship actually means. Because you're talking about being an ally on something that you still in your mind feel doesn't impact you. You're not concerned about a chokehold. You're not concerned about a no-knock warrant. Now, right. you understand the injustice that other people should be, right. and that other people are feeling it, that's fine. But the thing that really we have to be able to understand and important in our own minds is what about the thing that actually does impact you? That's where I think the allyship is being tested. So for example, when we're looking at the reality that, that right now, the wealth of, of, of a black college graduate is the same as the wealth of a white high school dropout. And knowing that we have a fundamental and moral obligation to be able to treat and, and, and deal with that, that now is talking and impacting you regardless of where your strata and your, and your, and your, and your segment is. No knock warrants is important and we have to be able to do that. Cho banning chokeholds is important, we have to do that. Ad addressing the law enforcement order bill of rights is important, we have to do that. But the reality is for many of the allies, you're not concerned about that because you've never had to deal with that. And so the question when it comes to real allyship is I think we have to both be able to understand our history and also be able to understand how willing are you to be uncomfortable in your own situation and understanding that part of your comfort came at the functional and structural discomfort of others. Right. That's, I think, that, that, that's that line right. that we have to be able to get to. Um, with that in mind, what, what would you recommend people do? Um, I think there's a, there's, there, there's a few um, that I would recommend. Uh, one is a book called, uh, that I know you know very, very well, Chris, called The Undocumented Americans. Oh, great book. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 it's a fantastic book. And, and, and it's, an, it's an important book because I think 
it, it, it really challenges the idea of what do we mean when we talk about Americans? What does it mean when we talk about, you know, the people who, who belong here? Uh, and what does it mean when we're having conversations about, uh, about this idea that we embrace and the history of this country about who has been embraced in that? Um, and I think it's just, in addition to being incredibly well written, um, it also is one of these things where it, uh, I, I think it gives a, a clear understanding of even when you're looking at current policies, for example, things like the CARES Act and who the CARES Act left in and who the CARES Act did not leave in. You know, this, the, books like The Undocumented Americans matters because it, it absolutely just gives a clear understanding of why that is, is actually incredibly important in that. Um, another one that I would actually recommend um, is a, uh, a, it's a book called Here I Stand by Paul Robeson. Mm. And I think that's an important book for, for, for all Americans to be able to read and understand. First of all, it, it's just, he, he lived one of the most extraordinary lives that you can ever possibly imagine. Uh, someone who was so beyond talented, so beyond gifted, uh, so beyond maligned for his beliefs. Um, and, and, but, but always stay true to who he was and never stop fighting for it. But I think it's a, it's a beautiful exploration of this country. It's a beautiful exploration of, uh, of, of black genius, um, and how difficult it is for it to grasp air, uh, in, in, in a, in a country that, uh, that oftentimes is reminding you that it, it's, uh, is reminding you that there is no place for that, that right. that's not why you are here. Uh, right, right. And Paul Robeson's story, I think, is so emblematic of this, of, of, of the power of contribution that we have made to this country and its history. Um, it's a powerful reminder of, of, uh, of, of some of our country's ugliest moments. But it's a powerful reminder of, I think, it's in, and the, the title is, uh, is so appropriate, where the title of the book is just simply, Here I Stand. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's a great recommendation. Um, and, uh, you know, Paul Robeson is one of those kind of weirdly, we don't know what to make of him in terms of his historical legacy or yeah. where to find him, um, but such an important, essential 20th century American. Um, well, Wes, thank you so much. Pleasure yes, thank you. talking with you. And, uh, and I hope lots of people go out and read Five Days. Me too. And it's always a pleasure talking to you, Chris, man. Congratulations on everything. Bless you. And now, here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. Gloria Darden gives birth to twins, a boy and a girl. The twins are born two months premature. In her early 20s, when she had the twins, Gloria had never attended high school. She could not read or write and struggled with heroin addiction. Tiny and underweight, Freddie and his twin sister, Frederica, spend their first months in the hospital. After five months, Gloria brings the twins back to the housing projects of West Baltimore. 1992. Freddie and his family move to 1459 North Cary Street in West Baltimore. The home rents for $300 a month. In 2009, it and 480 homes just like it will be named in a civil suit regarding the endemic levels of lead paint throughout those houses. By age two, Freddie and his twin sister have elevated levels of lead in their blood and suffer lasting brain damage. The family lives on Cary Street until the twins are six years old. 1995, Freddie starts school at Matthew A. Henson Elementary School in Sandtown, Winchester. Because of the lead poisoning, Freddie's behavior poses considerable challenges to the school's teachers. Statistically, among the least experienced and worst equipped educators in Baltimore City. His teachers enrolled Freddie in special education classes, which he would never leave. By the fifth grade, Freddie was four grade levels behind in reading. Driven out of the classroom by his intellectual disability, Freddie spends his early years in nearby recreation centers. 1998. Freddie is spending more and more time out of the classroom, experiencing increasingly long stretches out of school. Freddie starts to migrate to the corners and begins dealing drugs. At home, 
Freddie's stepfather leaves for drug rehab because of his heroin addiction. Without his income, Freddie's home experiences long stretches without electricity or running water. Freddie's godmother takes Freddie to church, where he volunteers delivering meals to senior citizens and washing cars. 2008. The Baltimore City Public Schools record Freddie's last attendance in school. He's 18. He's in the 10th grade. 2009. Freddie is arrested and sentenced to four years in prison for two counts of drug possession with intent to distribute. 2011. Freddie is paroled and back on the streets. 2013. Freddie is arrested again on drug possession and distribution. Shortly thereafter, Freddie's half-brother, Raymond Lee Gordon, 31 years old, is gunned down near the Inner Harbor in downtown Baltimore. April 12th, 2015, 8.39 a.m. At the intersection of West North Avenue and North Mount Street, four officers on bicycles attempt to stop Freddie Gray and another man who ran after making eye contact with the police. 8.40 a.m., police catch and arrest Freddie on the 1700 block of Pressbury Street. According to police accounts, the arrest takes place without incident and no force is required. 8.42 a.m., the police van is requested to take Freddie to the police station. At that point, Freddie indicates he has asthma and asks for an inhaler. Minutes later, when the van arrives, Freddie is put into leg irons and placed in the back of the van. 8.59 a.m., at Druid Hill Avenue and Dolphin Street, the van driver requests a secondary unit to drive over and check on Freddie in the back of the van. Minutes later, the van Freddie is riding in is requested to go to 1600 North Avenue to pick up another recently arrested individual. There is some communication between the police officers and Freddie, and his behavior and physical condition seem off, enough so that the officers will later admit that there was concern at that point that they needed to assess Mr. Gray's condition, how we responded, were we able to act accordingly. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us. Thank you.